Hello and welcome to our second episode of Rainbow Speaks. I'm Quinn Joseph. I am Kara Joseph, no relation. So, well, no, we're siblings. There's who's some to, relation. Who's to say? Uh, and we are still your hosts of the Rainbow Stages first and, to my knowledge, only Rainbow Stage podcast. <laughs> how are you How are you doing, Kara? I'm doing great. I'm a little tired this morning, but I'm feeling energized. Good. I at slept. the same time. I actually I slept because I'm a professional, so I wanted this to be like a good right. episode. So today, the topic is race and representation. Theater has, throughout history, always been a leader in political and social commentary. The early feminism of Ibsen, the political alienation of Brecht, the ahead-of-its-time anti-capitalist work of Arthur Miller, the stories of racial tolerance from Rodgers and Hammerstein, the subtle commentary on the shortcomings of the monarchy from Shakespeare, all these white men have worked generation after generation to shape what the theater looks like, sounds like, and feels like. As progressive and brilliant as these white men may have been in their own right, they have intentionally or not dominated a space and oversaturated it with a single perspective, the white perspective. Now, this isn't to say that it's a bad perspective either. After all, these are some of the greatest dramatic minds in all of Western theater. It's just that it isn't a perspective that accurately represents the diverse voices of our modern world. This diversity issue is slowly but surely being actively tackled by many theater companies and arts patrons alike. More people of color are being commissioned to write work than ever before, more actors of color are being cast than ever before, and more designers and creators of color are being asked to design and create than ever before. But they are working against hundreds of years of oppression and, to put it bluntly, whiteness. Now, the theater world is in an interesting position. There is a body of popular work out there by white artists that sells tickets, uh, garners praise and attention, but people are also trying to give more opportunities to IBPOC artists, that is, Indigenous, Black, and people of color, to share their voices and perspectives. While there isn't one clear solution, the process is ongoing and affecting artists like us every day. And here to discuss their personal experiences with race and representation in the theater space, we are thrilled to welcome two incredibly talented artists and Dare I say friends? <laughs> Ray Strawn and Rochelle Kives. Hi, friends. Hello. Hi, welcome Ooh, to welcome. the Rainbow Speak Studio. Thank you. This is where we speak and get speaking. To start, I, I think we're just kind of curious. Uh, you are both people of color, both been professionally working in theater for I don't know how long. How long have you both been working? Tell us about your experience. My first show ever, a professional show, was actually at Rainbow Stage, and that was South Pacific. Um, I'm not going to say how old I was, but it was in 1997. Were you even born? In the... I, that was the year I was born. No, it wasn't. I was in the children's <laughs> chorus, let's gotcha. just say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 You're doing the Dite Moi? Yeah. The... Uh, you know what? No, I wasn't that young. Okay. That was, But I was like, there was a Polynesian children's oh, chorus. Good. Myself and Joseph Civillo. Oh, wow. Okay. And Grace Morello, who's actually now his sister-in-law but yeah that was my first professional show so it's been it's been a minute Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so yeah the journey started at rainbow and then i left uh winnipeg uh as a teen and went to sheridan for musical theater college and then first show back was also south pacific where i met quinn yes that is where we met isn't that crazy 2017 yes you were born and alive very (laughs) alive yeah i was very much alive at this point i believe every time there's a production of south pacific a new theater artist is born (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so i'm excited to meet down the road whoever was born in our 27 i love it so that's this uh this theater really you know started my my theater journey and i went on to go to college for musical theater sheridan college in oakville um spent some years in toronto then worked on ships in the production cast for many many years doing all sorts of different kinds of cool shows I then left the ships and moved back to Winnipeg, started theater here, but I still run a group that goes back and forth to the ships, but very involved in the theater community here, and I'm very happy to be back. How about you, Ray? What's your What's your theater journey? Who are you? Who am I? (laughs) Uh, This is Ray. (laughs) Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You invited me. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) I'm Ray. Uh, I I started theater at university. I was uh, rec management in the phys ed department, and I decided to take theater because I'm horrible with with stage fright still am uh but then i just fell in love with theater and i've been doing it since 2010 my first production was a a co-pro with theater calgary and mtc uh cuckoo's nest where i played a black character funny both of our first characters were very racial 
Uh, what are we talking about again? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's a, that's about ten years, twelve years. I mean, yeah, you mentioned right away the idea of uh, being cast early on, as early as it gets, early on. <laughs> and I'll say that uh, production of South Pacific that was my first professional show, and that was I was the the servant Henri. Deep also, breath in. <laughs> also importantly, like racially cast. It was it's a a really interesting thing that I think. A lot of people, their like first foray into it is something that's like very specifically like you fit this role, and mm-hmm. so let's have you let's have you in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, I am curious: were there barriers past this this first casting? Did you have you done a lot of stuff that is uh, that was like racially cast specifically or ethnically cast specifically? I would say back then in the 90s <laughs> when you were born. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that actually, my, my singing teacher, Joy Lazo, she played Bloody Mary in that production. And so she was my teacher and she was like, all the students auditioned for the show. She's like, y'all would be perfect for the show. And then I had so much fun doing that show that year. And then I remember coming back the next year and I, I don't remember what show it was, but it was not an Asian show. Let's right. just say that. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say back, Back in the 90s and early 2000s, it was very different. And it was like, if you're Asian, you're going to be in Asian shows. Like, Mm -hmm. it was always my dream. I grew up wanting to be in Miss Saigon because I believed that was the only show that I could be a lead in. Right. And that was very much my thought process. Mm -hmm. Like, I never believed, oh, I can be, you know, the lead in The Music Man Mm -hmm. or or Carousel. Like, I, I was like, no, The King and I... South Pacific and Miss Saigon right. mm-hmm. are the shows. And that's what I was told in college. Wow. Yeah, that's Ooh. what I was told in college. It's not a lot of options. <laughs> no. God forbid you dislike any of those. I know. Yeah. So thankfully, times have changed. And we're, we're, I'm grateful for these opportunities where I love playing. Like I recently played a Filipino character in a show with Ray. And I loved being able to actually play someone from the Philippines because right. it's South Pacific's, mm-hmm. you know, Polynesian. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in vague. the, it's yeah, in the it is, it is. They point to a map. And right. Like, in this somewhere. area. Of that. And same with Miss Saigon. It's Vietnam, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and so to actually play a Filipino character is very like it was a really special time and but also being being knowing that there's opportunity to play other characters Mm -hmm. which I truly never thought when I was 22 years old coming out of college that that would ever be um something that I would do has being racially cast been something that's happened to you like over and over and over absolutely over and over and it will continue uh obviously (laughs) and uh, hopefully in a positive way we want to see more black characters on stage Yep. Uh, I remember talking about how we could change the community, how we can change the industry. And the easiest thing is to put black characters on stage. Mm-hmm. That's the easy part. Black mm-hmm. stories, black yeah. characters, people of color. That's easy. It's changing the audience and the, the system. Yeah. That's the real struggle. But barriers for me is just that constant reminder that there are only roles that you can play. And that's yeah. recently changed. Mm-hmm. And it's still optimistic that it'll, it'll fully change. But uh, it, it's still there that you know that you're not going to get this role in this family because most of the other actors are going to be white. Right. There's no way. Totally. And, yeah, and sometimes yeah. you go into the auditions like, why are you bringing me in? Yeah. yeah. You're bringing me in to check a box to say, oh, I saw someone of color. Yeah. But I know you're not going to cast me as this person's brother. It yeah. makes right. no yeah. sense. Yeah. It makes well, no sense. It, it yeah. is funny because uh, I'll see, uh, if I see, if I see like oh, brothers or uh, like twins or whatever in, as part of the casting, I'm like, they're not going to go identical yeah. twin. I shouldn't audition because, <laughs> yeah, because I know all the other black actors in the. And, <laughs> and they <laughs> don't. You know I, we don't. Right. We aren't going to do it together. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It is interesting because, like, even recently too, have seen uh, audition notices for certain shows, and I go, "Well, like, I know who's on Broadway for this show, and I know who was in the original cast." And even still, I'm like, "Do will they really want to see me?" Because when the actual cast comes out. It's the person that I expected it to be that looks exactly like the person who was on Broadway doing it or something. So there, it's still there a bit, but I, sure. I think directors are more willing and open to to uh, casting a more diverse cast. But it's mm-hmm. it's there's I, there's a internal barrier that I feel too of just going, is it even worth it to for me to go and and let them see me because I know that. I'm not really what they're looking for. Yeah. That's a tough one too, to know, am I going to match? Yeah. And, and that's a terrible 
thing to yeah. think. Families can look so different yeah. in so many ways. Like Absolutely. I, I have a child who's, you know, my husband's from the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. She looks like me, but she doesn't have the same skin color mm-hmm. as right. me. Yeah. But she's my daughter. But on stage, would people be confused? Yeah, probably. We have a white mother. I mean, she said for a long time, she's like, yeah, you're my kids. Like, that's how I see you is you're my kids. And so there is something to, we look very different. I bet when we went to the grocery store, it was like, <laughs> is this an Angelina Jolie situation? <laughs> 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 yeah. These two little kids like holding yeah. our, our white mom's hands. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, people probably look. They, yeah. they probably look. Really interesting that like the way that we can we can in real life get past I'm going to use the word colorblindness because that's kind of trying to transition into the next bit. Mm -hmm. We have that bit of colorblindness when it comes to reality because sometimes we face it. But on stage, a lot of people have a much harder time suspending their disbelief. There's a little bit of, (laughs) uh, that's not right. That can't (laughs) happen. But if you meet those people in real life, you'd be like, oh, well. But I I am curious about the idea of colorblindness uh, in casting. Is that something that, uh, or I'm guessing that both of you have, have encountered this in some capacity, right? I'm not a fan of colorblind casting, of the term. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I am very much in favor of color-conscious casting. Mm-hmm. I love that. I think a director should absolutely be aware of what they're of doing, course. who they're yeah. casting, yeah. what the audience will see. Because yeah. the audience can't shut their eyes off. No. You know, absolutely. They, they see what they see, and that's the reality of what they see in their whole lives. Right. In the real world, so I don't know. Uh, in the hockey sweater, Harry Nelkin was old rock, and mm-hmm. then Nathan Malolos was young rock. Yeah. And I think the way they casted it was they did all the adults first. The, the way it was casted with Harry and, and Nathan, it was so beautiful. Yeah, you would have great. never guessed in a million years. Like, they just portrayed the character so rock Kettier with so much heart that it didn't matter that Harry being a 75-year-old and then little Nathan. It's interesting how, like, depending on the genre audiences are willing to accept or not accept yeah Mm -hmm. totally you know it's i I find like in shakespeare or period pieces or even musicals there's a a more suspension of disbelief or willing to accept what Mm -hmm. you just see Mm -hmm. as what it is you know what is that there's already a large suspension going into that if you're going to see shakespeare you're already saying okay so these people speak in poetry that doesn't happen or these people break into song and musical theater that doesn't happen At that point, you're already primed going into it to see something that's a little bit, you know, different. I remember like in the years before we went there, but in the high school we went to, uh, they did a production of Cinderella. And there's this really, (laughs) really talented black uh, woman, young woman who played Cinderella. Now, the story of Cinderella is that you can't tell who it was, right? The entire time the prince is trying to find out who was this mystery person. Uh, Every other person in the production was white, obviously, because that's the neighborhood we grew up in. That's the high school we went to. Yeah, the school ever. So I remember a lot of people being like, how does what? he not know? <laughs> 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 Wait a minute. Yeah. And and the question I'm kind of curious about is, is, like, those situations, they exist. Does it derail the production? Does it change things significantly? If it is, like, part of the plot of the show... <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> you ask a lot of questions. That's right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who doesn't do the work, it's on them. Yeah. <laughs> I like that because my point of view, it's like whoever is right for the job, it doesn't matter what you look like, what gender you are, what color you are. If you're right for the role, you're right for the role. But I do think we're still we're still not quite there. And yeah. especially in Winnipeg, like certain theaters have more traditional audiences. Mm-hmm. But for me, I always think whatever, whoever is whoever's best for the part, yeah. truly. And like... I was raised Jewish. I was raised as a Filipino Jew and very confused yeah. person. <laughs> but it's still like thinking like I, you know, I've done a couple of workshops at Winnipeg Jewish Theater and still always in the back of my mind is that like I don't look traditionally Jewish. Mm-hmm. I look more Filipino and that's why I identify mm-hmm. as that. But I, I've asked myself these questions. Why? Why do I identify as that? Is it because I know I'll never be cast as a, like a traditional yeah. Jewish person because I just don't look like that stereotype? Totally. We're predominantly Russian and white European. What? Yeah. But you, what, what, I'm not going to go in for a Russian right? role. Yeah. But you totally could. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, we were also predominantly raised by our mother. So our like Christmases would look like cabbage rolls and pierogies and, you know what I, I mean? I never like, knew this. Yeah. This is so yeah. fascinating so, to me. So we'd have that food and like uh, we I mean, were connected to our Trinidadian roots a yeah. little bit, but only a little bit. And so predominantly like our, you know, most of our family Polish lives. Polish Ukrainian. Is, is Polish Ukrainian. We eat that food. So that's, that's really interesting. I super relate to that. I'm sure, Ray, I mean, did you have a, a different experience? Again, it depends on the play, and it depends on the theater company. Uh, if I know that they have a track record of not being blind in casting, uh, which also is a term I don't like to yeah, use, yeah, not, just the, not just the theory of it, but the terminology. Yeah. Uh, it's not very good. But, you know, you know, going back to your comment is when you see a role of a white person, I'm not going to audition. Like, it sucks as someone who's mathematically half Filipino right. to see Asian roles and be like, nah. And I grew up in a very Filipino home. Yeah. So to be, see those roles, it's like, eh, that sucks, because I know they're not going to cast me in the end. Totally. Or at least the belief. belief. Sorry. Is, no, yeah. I was saying Ray helped me with my Filipino accent for California. <laughs> I'd be like, Ray, how does this sound? Like, uh, That's really interesting. Like, it is what these seem like they're internal barriers, but they exist because of external Factors. things. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm not going to, I didn't think this before. <laughs> yeah, you, I started exactly. experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was that the experience of, I think a lot of people have, especially when you didn't grow up predominantly within that culture, there's all, often an experience where you find out that you are different. Uh, I, I was like in grade three before I like really <laughs> it clicked for me Aww. that I was different. Uh, and like the only thing that had, had really bothered me up until that point was people would the peach Crayola crayons would be like, oh, skin color, skin color, it's skin color. Can you pass me skin color? I'd be like, no, no, no this is mine's this other crayon. Um, so it was just like really interesting to see. <laughs> I worked That's actually past a pretty it. nice way to be introduced into. Oh, difference. to be fair, no, no, the actual introduction was a little harsher. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But was that like, was those, nice. were, those were the breadcrumbs that led me to yeah. the blackness, if you will. That experience, as Kara said, like you don't come into anything thinking, oh, I'm different, unless somebody's already told you that. Either they give us an opportunity or they reinforce the negative narrative. Or not narrative, the negative reality of what's going on. So you think at this point the pressure's on uh, for these companies now because there has been a shift, uh, notably in who's getting more work, who is, where they are consciously, they're doing calls specifically, they're saying in these calls, we are prioritizing you know people of the lgbtq community people uh who are in the ibpoc community uh things of that nature you think that it's it's very possible that right now the pressure is on that if we do these auditions these companies might look at it and be like or consider what kind of shows that they're putting on each season Mm -hmm. too i did want to ask like then have you if you think that there has been a shift if you can mark like in your careers or in the last decade or two decades or you know couple years or whatever it is is there something where you think oh this there's a market shift in the perception or how companies are uh trying to cast things or go about things well well quinn (laughs) these are not easy questions (laughs) of course not um but like like i said like one of the main reasons i went on ships when i did like i i stayed in toronto for two years after college was because i felt like there was no place for me being on the ship they they didn't there is like um one of my casts there was always like 18 of us and four singers and like i worked in a cast where there was two black male singers and then there was me and the, and the other female singer and it was just so and people all the dancers and acrobats were from different countries yeah it was so united and i loved that some some people in my cast sometimes barely spoke english mm-hmm. it was beautiful but i was like this is awesome this yeah. is like what and i just thrived in that environment and then um when i came back i was like holy hot <laughs> what is this and and like i said my literally my first audition back was south pacific yeah i do think i felt a shift even back then so so i guess i was auditioning for these things in 2016 mm. But I did feel a shift and I felt like when I, after all those years of being away, I was like, cool, I can start auditioning for different roles and not get turned away. And I feel like I actually have 
a fighting chance. Yeah. But I do even think before 2020, before BLM, there was a bit of a shift, I will say. But also for my generation, from our generation, we're of a different generation. So there just wasn't as much. So maybe for me being of a different age demographic, <laughs> so <you're> like, <laughs> it but, felt uh, like the shift came sooner. But maybe to some, it did, I, I just still, I don't know. Right. Uh, I, I think like when I started in the biz 2010-ish, it was at almost, at, I guess, the, the height of color blind casting that was a thing to do uh, I, no it was a thing to do everyone looked mm-hmm. at stratford and be like oh they got a lot of black people on stage and yeah. people of color that's what we got to do and it was not until the the george floyd new shift yeah. that it's where oh we got to put more representation on stage mm-hmm. and stories on stage mm-hmm. uh so the, i haven't part i guess two two good shifts individually as an actor i guess my shift came when i got to play a black character with a full character arc yeah. Where people are like, oh, this dude can act. You know, <laughs> right. he doesn't just have to play roles where he dies at the intermission. I think it's important to play black roles because those are the roles mm-hmm. I get attached to mm-hmm. and I give my best performances because yeah. I understand what's going on. Yeah. It's interesting too because obviously um, now that more shows are being commissioned uh, from uh, IPOC. Uh, artists a lot of the shows do revolve still around like trauma and cultural issues and i just want to know your opinion on that especially because those sometimes may be the roles that are available what does it feel like to often play roles that revolve around trauma and what does that do for yourself as an artist it sucks my soul (laughs) 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 where'd you get that cigarette It is draining yeah. at times. I remember over the pandemic starting to do some of these workshops and I was like, oh my God. And a four hour workshop on Zoom. I mean, that in itself is draining. Oh, God, yeah. The content, you know, I was reading, I was like, gosh, and it's kind of like your energy is literally zapped because it takes so much of you because it's part of you. It's part of your journey and who you are. But it's so important, as you said, to tell these stories. But I think any time as an actor, when you have a lot of trauma on stage, it's like it's hard reliving that trauma, I think. Yeah. 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 Day after day. If you frame it in this way, I'm, I'm going to do this. this isn't necessarily my opinion, but is it a positive thing to put on these shows about trauma and I, especially post George Floyd was a huge one now up until that point I had been cast doing roles like Henri uh, actually a lot of people named Henry I was like a caretaker <laughs> named Henry I was a convict named Henry I was like I don't even know a black person oh, named right. Henry yeah. uh, and, but I was all of them um, <laughs> but then after that there was uh, a lot of different shifts. There was one where I was getting asked to do things like panels to talk about race and representation, or I was doing uh, workshops to as like tra- uh, traumatized black roles, things like that. And uh, what's interesting about it is the the job of telling the story of trauma was, or that that responsibility was kind of it was incumbent on me to do it and uh, other people of color to do that job, meaning they had to then relive trauma over and over and talk about their trauma over and over even when they were at a time where like it was already really tiring by that point like by george floyd Mm -hmm. this was you know like the eighth ninth giant police violence atrocity that had been committed where i was very very aware of it since high school but it was it's really interesting to have that that responsibility attached to your careers now and attached to the work that as much as there is Um, I'm not even saying there's less opportunity to do the stuff that is like lighter and fun and whatever, but there seems to be a lot more opportunity to do the stuff that is like trauma, not musical, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but like, you know what I mean? Or like, I mean, you played MLK in a show and you did like, there's a lot of push to to represent roles, but to represent them uh, in this sort of trauma centered uh, way. Is that something that is positive if we keep asking people of color to like, relive this i i think it has to happen i don't know if you're familiar with cornell west uh enlighten me great american black philosopher this is we have this gift of theater where we can show people the reality of the world in hopes of creating a better reality and i think it's important for people to see all types of trauma so they understand the reality of the world we live in as artists yeah we we do have to go through that trauma and relive it and that's why we have to prioritize self-care I mean, it's interesting what you say, another type of token that, yeah, with trauma comes anger. And if you if you if you see these shows and you're like, oh, these people are angry. (laughs) Like I I did a play that was written by the lovely Primrose. 
She's a local playwright, Filipino, but also Jewish. Um, and she wrote a play called Where Are You From? And it was like a short uh, short play for Tiny Plays, Big Ideas. And I was very angry in that. But it, that was her portrayal of this incident that had occurred yeah. with um, a white racist busker, Robbie Patterson, who it's very hard to be mean to him. Because he's like the nicest <laughs> yeah. person in the world. And But obviously in, in, the, in the realm of her world and this when this happened, she was so angry. And I really wanted to honor what she felt in that moment. Um, so I agree. There, with telling these stories, there is so much trauma, and and I can't wait for the day where we can mix the two and yeah. like yeah. I gotta plug Mabuhai, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my totally. dear friend Joseph yeah. Savillo, who has written Mabuhai and has poured his heart and soul into this show. But it's very light and has so many beautiful like musical moments. But it also talks about like the struggles within Filipino families, like when they don't have money. You know, when when Mm -hmm. they're not pretty enough, when they're not white enough, because in Philippine culture, especially in the Philippines, they want light skin. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of touches on all of that. But but there's a lightness to it. Right. One thing that kind of sticks out to me that it's something I have a hard time like grasping is we're telling these stories and I think they're beautiful and necessary to tell, but we're still telling them in a colonial space in like a westernized theater space and so we're still drawing a certain audience and I just wonder how how that could change or how or like what the journey is to inviting the audience who also has experienced those things into the space because I feel like for myself if I'm going to see a show um, like Calpurnia for example it's for me to heal and and enjoy and connect to whereas for a white audience member it might not be that and so I'm uh, it might just be more of a learning thing mm-hmm. for them so I'm I'm just curious of how we can get more people into our space when the space has historically not been for them yeah, it's funny. I was talking to uh, a couple ADs, and they'll program a show, whether it be an Indigenous show or a Black show or an Asian show, and they'll be like, yo, why didn't they all come out? <laughs> it's yeah. like, because we're still in this building that's never been welcoming for decades. Yeah. That, you got to go out in the community. You got to build relationships yeah. and bring people in, whether it's free tickets, and just and bring them in young. Yeah. If you want to see that diversity within your audience, force that within your audience. Because, like, literally, some of these buildings are, like, Eurocentric, sorry to say, brutalist. So, in architecture (laughs) alone, it's very Eurocentric. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for our whole family to go, it's going to cost X amount, and that's just not in our budget. Like, Mm -hmm. how do we make it accessible for them? Mm Because it is important. Mm -hmm. But if we want the next generation to see our shows, (laughs) we got to get them in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do you know who tells great stories is there's people, uh, lots of people from underrepresented communities who have experienced just a multitude of amazing different things, whether it's the move from a different country or growing up without as much money and making do or finding connections. Like what I'll say is coming from not much money is you gain a lot of friendship within the family you Mm -hmm. have. Because yes. you're not going out to like hang out with friends or spending money at the mall yes. every day or whatever. You don't have that. So instead, you're like in your backyard yeah. with your siblings yeah. having fun that way or whatever. And you can tell some really, really beautiful stories from the love you feel from like those connections created from something that is negative. The, the lack of, of wealth mm-hmm. sparks a lot of creativity and a lot of want to be heard. Where do you learn to get formally trained to tell those stories? Yeah. Where how do you learn to communicate? Even the the university going to let you tell them yeah. if they don't if mm-hmm. you don't have that connection. Exactly. I don't know. And uh, today we're not finding the solution. But I'm just <laughs> curious. Like, what can we do if anything? Like, what what are things out there that you really want to see? Um, or out there, or that you really want to see, rather. <laughs> you just um, said we're not finding the solution today. I know, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. I love how your yeah. mind thinks. <laughs> of of just how do we get young people to have their voice heard, to see themselves on the stage when it's there? Accessibility, because we our public transportation isn't our strongest, obviously, right, no. thing in our city. <laughs> but and also, yeah, accessibility to lessons when you're young, like what you're saying, incredible. Also, like got to plug Joseph again because Rise, which she created for mm-hmm. IB Pac people who don't have the resources, it was free two week training from mm-hmm. industry professionals. 
you know, some of these kids have not had access to that and they're so talented, but they don't even one singing lesson is too much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's expensive. It is. It's and so, so, so we're seeing the same patterns happen from generation to generation. And now with inflation, it's like who can afford to send their kids to dance classes six times a week or to opera lessons or to singing or to all the things that you need to succeed. Yeah, those privileges exist, and it's not even a, it's not a bad thing to have those privileges. It's just we want more people to have those privileges. More accessibility. Yeah, I know that's actually one thing that Rainbow did that was huge for them uh, in casting a Hockey Sweater was going to communities, including rural communities and whatever, like going to Brandon, I believe, right, to yeah. do it to one of the casting. Like it is incredible the difference you get when you see that <laughs> many people. Yeah. And then we saw when we saw the show, those kids. I'll tell you, <laughs> they're like Broadway level uh, show are. stompers, yeah, like because there's a that many of them got the opportunity to be seen. Yes, mm-hmm. and you have to create a want to be there again. Like you can't expect the program and then automatically people will show up. Yeah, there has to be a sacrifice to get a game, and a lot of these theaters are funded by the taxpayer. Yeah. So you got to represent the people who are paying for your ability to do what you want to do. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, be a, an involved member in communities that you want to see in your theater, which should be all. Uh, mm-hmm. communities. I just want to highlight, you said something, sacrifice to get a gain. That's something that I think is really, really interesting when it comes to positions of power uh, in general. There is um, a theory, uh, like a, a sociological theory called leveling down. And it's this idea that in order to achieve equity, it's not that we need to create more opportunities necessarily by just creating them out of nothing. It's like this essentially like printing more money. You print more money as an economy, you're not actually raising up the bottom, uh, the people below the poverty line. You're creating so much inflation that their money is now valueless, that they now have. But instead, uh, leveling down takes the people with the power and redistributes it in order to give other people opportunities. Mm-hmm. Now, there's something interesting about the idea of having to sacrifice to get get something positive. Is it something where you you want to see companies taking losses in order to provide these opportunities? Because in some cases, that has to be it. After the inception of the, the WNBA, yeah. a lot of NBA teams had WNBA uh, affiliation teams. And for a long time, these WNBA teams lost a lot of money. And they weren't profitable because there weren't there wasn't enough of a subscriber base for them. Now there are teams that thrive in the WNBA, like the the Winnipeg or Winnipeg, <laughs> New York, uh, Winnipeg of the South. I like to call it. Um, no, but the New York Liberty, for example, is a team that's quite profitable uh, in the WNBA because they went through this period of we're okay, we make so much money that we're okay taking some losses to let women in sports thrive Mm -hmm. and have a a professional space that is more than just uh now granted there's still a huge pay disparity and there's still a lower subscriber base but they're making actual money which shifts everything Mm because when there's a model laid out for now here's a version of this that really works and really works profitably because at the end of the day money seems to drive everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're getting something really really special out of that and if the models laid out others are sure to follow. Is this something where you you want to see I I'll just say this I want to see uh, mm-hmm. companies that that are doing exactly that kind of thing where they are okay taking some losses in order to really, really end up making gains. Mm -hmm. And I think importantly, it's not those losses won't be as severe as I think Mm -hmm. people are afraid of. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Are are theaters built to make money? No. Oh, no. (laughs) Just wondering. Yeah. I hope not. (laughs) Yeah. Are people making money? (laughs) No. My hope is not for theater companies to lose money. My hope is that they're willing to take chances or, yeah. or, you know, diversify without fear of having losses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's so hard because we've just, I, I don't want to say the words, but we have just gone through the pandemic yeah. where theaters were like lucky to survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to see these theaters, like we said, take chances, but of course we don't want to see yeah. any of them. But I, I think that we need to find the balance but I think to how we can get there. survive the pandemic know, right? they could do that You're right. yeah. if they could survive Absolutely. this Absolutely. of not putting on any shows there you go then they can survive. there you go yeah. that's a very good point and but, but it's true because if you see good art on stage uh, for me it's like i don't i don't need to know the show just yeah. surprise yeah. me like yeah. i love seeing shows that yeah. i don't know and being oh, yeah. surprised being like what 
And I think we need to be open to that. At the end of the day, it's good theater. And yes. I think good and I think good art is like anyone will enjoy it. Exactly. It doesn't matter what the content is. And even when it comes to shows that are specifically racialized, the important thing I think to recognize about racism is it is something that is really it's traumatic and oppressive and painful. But at the core of racism, it's it's still a construct. So the feelings we're having from racism aren't specific. It's not like, you know, as people of color, we're the only ones who have felt othered or alienated. So those themes, othering and alienation, are universal. Just because it's packaged through racism doesn't mean that a, a person of any color uh, can't watch that same thing and understand it. They still might see that and say, oh, I do remember this time I felt this. And if doing those things makes people like that feel this as well, then maybe I shouldn't <laughs> do those things um, in a very basic uh, <laughs> sort yeah. of like you maybe uh, maybe a little bit naive sort of way. But that's what brings me a little bit of hope uh, is that or as much as we maybe want to tell stories that are specific to certain cultures, the themes are human. Um, mm -hmm. not just that. racialized or ethnic. Because we're all just human. We're all just trying our best to survive in this Absolutely. madness. <laughs> Crazy, wacky world. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask, uh, generally, for both of you, you've talked about some roles you've had. Do you have any roles that you saw with fondness, racialized or not or whatever? What are your favorite roles? Do you have any dream roles still that you, you've yet to fulfill? Uh, I want to know your favorite role that you've done so far, if you can think of it, or just some notables, uh, and then maybe a dream role uh, that you have somewhere down the line. Maybe they're the same. Maybe they're the yeah. same. Maybe you've played your dream, dream role. Been realized, yeah. Right? I, I think actually my dream role has been realized. <gasps> what is it? MLK. Oh, I, I've wanted yeah. to do that play for years and years and years. Yeah, I've, I've checked that one off. Yeah. And one of my favorite roles was Simon in The Whipping Man that we did at Winnipeg mm. Jewish Theater. Cool. It's funny because I, I always get weird when I'm asked, like, what my dream roles are because I literally, my only dream role as a child was Kim and Miss Icon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I said a few times and then the dream became just to work. And then it, it's, and it's funny and I'm like, I don't know if I ever allowed myself to dream. Is that weird? Um, or like to yeah. think that I could play these characters? But I didn't know, like, I didn't know Pressy and Calpurnia. I did not know Anna Kettier in the hockey sweater. Uh, I got very attached to Pressy because, of course, she was the inspiration of my grandma and playing a Filipino character. Yeah. So a lot of their ism were in that role. And then Anna, I love. I loved Anna mm -hmm. in the hockey sweater, but I didn't know her. Yeah. So I didn't know either of these roles existed. And maybe that's, like, the beauty of what we were seeing. Roles I didn't know existed became my dream roles. As a black actor, it's almost like a need to fill a fellow, yeah. a need to do Caliban. Yeah, totally. Uh, and for a few years in my career, I was like, I don't want to do those roles. Mm -hmm. I don't want to fall into that box. But when they presented themselves, and with the right director, yeah. right. Um, they were also life changing. Like I got to play Caliban as someone who owned the island and fooled the other people to do work for him. Right. So in that inter interpretation, it was great not playing a servant Caliban, yeah. Yeah. playing an empowered Caliban. So I think it really depends on who's directing. Yeah. yeah, because I think that's. I mean, I think that's another thing that's happening is a lot of reimaginings of let's take something that exists and tell it like the hockey sweater a story uh, as old as Canadian time. Where let's take it and let's let's tell it from from the perspective of representing a way more diverse group of people. Growing up, who were your inspirations? Kim and Miss Saigon. She was my hero, Alea yeah. Salonga. Yeah. She was like my idol forever and ever, and I had my cassette tape. But yeah, she was because they like found they when they were doing the net like, you know, I guess worldwide search. They found her in the Philippines. She was young and like, I want to be like her. <laughs> and Ma'an Denisio, who is also the original Kim in the Toronto <laughs> production. And was like, God, who was recently my mentor. She's incredible. But yeah, not theater based. I would have to say my grandmother coming here with with nothing like my mom came here with $50 in her pocket and, and a kid. 
and started from scratch. And they all lived on a house in a house on Maryland, like all of them. There was like 20 of them <laughs> that they came one by wow. one and then slowly moved. And I always drive by and I'm like, that's where it all began. And I'm so grateful for all their sacrifices. Um, but I think my grandma, especially because she was uh, and she was a widow at a young age. Her youngest child was only seven years old. So, so coming here and learning, you know, speaking English and I just picture her walking downtown in the winters and then like taking the bus to come babysit us. Being of sacrifice for gains, right? That's (laughs) that's who who better to sacrifice Mm -hmm. it. Always parents, especially as a theater artist, (laughs) uh, when you need as much support as you can get, (laughs) uh, financially, emotionally, psychologically. Uh, It always, always goes back to my parents. Controversial take, I guess. As a performer and kind of finding my black identity, it kind of goes to Bill Cosby Mm. and the Cosby show. It just kind of intrigued me into really looking into my blackness and how I want to identify Mm. as a black person and not seeing negative stereotypes on his show and seeing black art being praised and black music being praised was very influential to me, although he was a shitty person. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Goes without saying. Yeah, the culture uh, of, you know, wanting to go to secondary education the the belief that a man can stay at home take care of the house and raise the children while mm-hmm. the wife goes out with a prominent career and does her thing mm-hmm. those yeah. all been very big influences on me mm-hmm. so a younger person's example is like fresh prince was also a similar Dr. thing like, yeah, yeah. he was like successful Absolutely. black people living the the high life yeah uh, based on yeah. their hard work dun, dun, dun. final question, question. To you, what is the most exciting thing happening in theater? It could be in Winnipeg. It could be globally. You know, it's it's been a difficult but exciting time from the mm-hmm. huge shift from George Floyd. Yeah. Black Lives Matter. Uh, that's still happening. Of course. And also, what's happening before it, but the George Floyd, that is what, that really, like, I mean, it gave it so much prominence yeah. uh, and shifted, I think, culturally a lot. And it created open conversation. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Which we absolutely had to have. So yeah. that's exciting. That's yeah. still happening. There's no, we, we haven't solved it. No. Mm-hmm. Although we tried here today. We tried. <laughs> uh, we got pretty far. There's, yeah. Probably, yeah, there's a few say, good, there's I a few good so. clips that could probably go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there, there's a, a huge movement that's still happening. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think we're, we're moving in the right direction and seeing these stories that we haven't seen on stage before. Mm-hmm. You know, seeing Filipino musicals, seeing, I know they're doing prison dance or an all Filipino show mm-hmm. at the Citadel. We're exposing our audiences as much as we've talked about, you know, how we need to engage the younger generation. We are exposing these audiences to stories they've never seen before. That is a win in itself, Mm -hmm. for sure. And I think we're moving in the right direction and we just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Also, for if you're looking for more representation, you need to be able to... uh bring people in have them understand the current structure and 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 be able to sort of work within it to then forward change and have them become leaders and restructure after they understand the current structure and can be successful yeah, within it there is that upper management there's still boards there's the bosses essentially like the people in power that is still there's a huge disparity in that mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. And it's hard as much as there's hope. There's also sometimes when, you know, you, when we are opening up this conversation and talking about that, there's a sense of disappointment. And like, for, you know, and sometimes when we we want to see that change and we see, oh, this is the way that's being programmed or and you, you feel that heavy, yeah. that mm-hmm. heaviness. Mm-hmm. And I think we all feel that. So as yeah. much as I'm like, yay, we're moving in the right direction. There is a lot of there are many times where I feel yeah. sad that why aren't we there yet? Yeah. Or you, why baby steps? Yeah. You see the scope of the issue and then you sit back and go like, oh. Yeah. Okay, here we go. It's hard. And it's hard not to take it on. But I will say, uh, being a part of, I mean, I'd still classify myself in that emerging category uh, as an artist. Seeing people like you, uh, who are amazing, established artists who are doing lots of work uh, and lots of incredible work. Also, check these people out. If they're in a show, see it. Um, That does a lot because it's, it's more than just, oh, there's a great singer and actor, great actors, great performers, great creators, great directors in in the both of you. It's there's people who are also doing this and Mm -hmm. like speaking out about it and helping represent groups. And not that any of us can ever represent an entire group. We're not Mm -hmm. monolithic by any means. But having some people uh, like you out there 
is also another hopeful thing. So I will say in those moments of like the little bit of despair, <laughs> yeah. uh, when we're thinking about, oh, things aren't what we want them to be because they never are and maybe never will be. There's still a lot of excitement in this exists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This was and, a joyful conversation yeah. despite the context. It was. Absolutely. It was. Yeah. And Ray actually gave me this piece of advice and said this to me one one day when Uh-oh. I was feeling a little down. No, he's like, <laughs> you can't make the change unless you're in the room. Ray was just reading. Was pretty like, good. There's right? a, there a poster with a cat on it behind the show. <laughs> like, yeah, we're, we're having noodles <laughs> and like, yeah. any specific show, just like in general, mm-hmm. like if if in any aspect of life, like yeah. if you want, you know, things to move and change and policies, anything, you got to be in there. Yes. Mm-hmm. So let's you get let's, be from the let's be in there and let's get people in. Yeah. There. We're in yeah. this room. Yeah. Sure doing are. it right now. Okay. On that, now let's do some plugs. Uh, <laughs> if anyone has any anything that's currently like upcoming any projects that you're excited that you can talk about so yeah i'm doing a podcast ray and betty talk sports we talk about sports it's like the other half of my life i'm with mtyp coming up doing the velveteen rabbit amazing and i get to work with rochelle again yes i did are we allowed to say that i just said it (laughs) oh my god keep that in maybe keep it in (laughs) so yes i'm very excited to to do that secret musical that we're in (laughs) yeah And uh, yeah, I'll be. I'm going on the ship in a in a couple weeks. So I'll be on and off. So get on a boat. Ship. Yeah, <laughs> everyone, uh, get on the boat. <laughs> everyone get on a boat. I'll do me. Uh, I'm at, on. I'm at Quinn Joseph on Instagram, and I'm a teacher. So I don't follow him. Don't follow, <laughs> don't, don't follow me if you're a student of mine. <laughs> Uh, Kara. Follow <laughs> um, me on Instagram at Kara J Joseph. But uh, also, uh, I want to plug uh, Rainbow Harmony Project, uh, the LGBTQ plus choir uh, for LGBTQ plus and allied folks who want to join. Um, we start in September, and it is a great time. You can come out if you're not sure if you want to join. Come to a rehearsal anyway. All the information's at rainbowharmonyproject.ca. What's your affiliation with it? I'm the executive director. Oh, <laughs> love that. Yes. Oh, clout. Oh, clout. <laughs> um, <laughs> amazing. Uh, and I think we also want to offer, uh, if folks want to uh, reach out to us at all, planning on doing a little bit of community engagement where possible, answer some questions if you have. Uh, but please leave uh, any questions or comments on the YouTube video of this podcast. And subscribe. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, like, subscribe, smash that subscribe uh, button. Leave a comment down below. Hello, Hit that speakers. notification yeah. bell when you're excited to hear more. Um, <laughs> yeah, do all that stuff. <laughs> Clearly, we've never done this before. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you again, Rochelle. For joining thank you for, for having joining us. us. It was so lovely. We don't have a sign off, do we? Um, we just spoke. <laughs> We're gonna go eat some cabbage rolls. Yeah. <laughs> all together. Yeah. Now let's go eat some cabbage. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Rainbow Speaks. Our hosts are Quinn and Kara Joseph, and today's special guests were Rochelle Kives and Ray Strawn. For the Digital Studio, I'm Daphne Finlayson, your Technical Creative Director, and our Content Creative Director is Duchess Cayetano. Music for the show is provided by Duncan Cox. This podcast was recorded and produced on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional home of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We gratefully acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts in making this podcast possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.